This is the WTF Bach Podcast. Right, that fjord goes fingers. This is the podcast about all things Johann Sebastian Bach. Brought to you by Evan Shinners. WTF Bach. Brought to you by Evan Shinners. Join WTF Bach as he guides your mind through a contrapuntal journey. And now, and now here's WTF Bach. This is the end. This is the end. Amazing to think that we've actually got here, discussed our way through every single fugue, each of the four canons, we've solved the riddle of the so-called deathbed chorale, we've explained the appearance of the 13th fugue arranged for two harpsichords, and yet, have I really said anything about the art of fugue? I think I could go back to the start, to the first fugue, and probably explain the work using a complete different tactic, maybe not repeating anything that was said before, and still explain the work in yet a different way, then, even then, I'd have left so much unsaid. The Art of Fugue, it has been my main project for about two years now, I've committed it to memory, I've performed it, I've spent a year and a half making podcast episodes about it, and still, the other day, while practicing a particular passage, I realized there was a nicely embedded canonic passage between two inner voices that I'd never noticed was there. That construction, that sort of jewel, the diamond in the rough, that is typical Bach. I might say typical with all classical music, but particularly with Bach. This Art of Fugue is just one of the many keyboard works that's like this. I could spend an equal amount of time on either book of the Well-Tempered Clavier, the Goldberg Variations, any of the sets of the suites. It's always the same experience. And this is just the solo keyboard works. How infinitely more vast is the world of all the cantatas, the organ works. How incredible. And every time I have some space from one of these giant works, I come back to it having a fresh perspective that renews my interest in the work. For example, I spent most of 2018, 2019 performing the first book of the Well-Tempered Clavier. I put it away. And when I sort of dusted it off earlier this year, I thought, my God, how could I have performed this? I knew absolutely nothing about this music. And again, that's the experience that one has with such deep art. And I think that because Bach is very proprietary, each one of us has a similar experience with it, and yet it's completely personal. We feel like it edifies us. In fact, I'm riffing a bit on what Albert Schweitzer said about the well-tempered clavier, because what I've tried to do in this podcast is talk about the art of fugue, to talk and try and get some deeper understanding about it. But talking, well, it doesn't really do it. To quote Schweitzer, he's talking about the well-tempered clavier, but of course he could be talking about any major work of Bach. The fact that the work today has become common property may console us for the other fact that an analysis of it is almost as impossible as to depict a wood by enumerating the trees and describing their appearance. We can only repeat again and again. Take them and play them and penetrate into this world for yourself. Aesthetic elucidation of any kind must necessarily be superficial here. What so fascinates us in the work is not the form or the build of the piece, but the worldview that is mirrored in it. It is not so much that we enjoy the well-tempered clavier as that we are edified by it. Joy, sorrow, tears, lamentation, laughter, to all these it gives voice, but in such a way that we are transported from the world of unrest to a world of peace and see reality in a new way. Right, so aesthetic elucidation must necessarily be superficial. Well, that's what I've been doing in the podcast, but... It is my hope that after all this, you, the listener, you don't come away feeling like you've learned anything about the Art of Fugue, but rather, rather that perhaps you're ready to listen to it and listen to it again and again and take it and make it your own. The podcast, the podcast about, about Johann Sebastian Bach, Bach. Brought, to brought, you, brought to you by his prodigal son, WTF Bach. So with all that said, let's do some housekeeping. This podcast is a cumulative one, so if this is your first episode, of course, welcome. But if you do find yourself lost or at a loss to comprehend the weight, the gravity of what this final fugue represents in this work, I suggest you go back and listen to a few episodes earlier, or at least the first episode. Why not? And initially I had made this episode, and it was just too long. And for me, this fugue is so important, so beautiful, I didn't want anyone to be put off by this length of the episode, so I'm breaking this final fugue into two episodes. This one will discuss the technical stuff and the myths surrounding this fugue, and finally the other episode will just be a close look at the music itself. Well, so how do we begin? Possibly with a brief recap of how we got here. Fugues one through four were simple fugues. The first two used the theme right side up, the second two used the theme upside down. Fugues five through seven were stretto fugues, using themes both right side up and upside down at will. Fugue six saw the theme coming twice as quickly now. Fugue seven saw the fugue coming in all three speeds, regular, twice as quickly, twice as slow. Fugues eight, nine, 10, and 11 were the compound fugues. Eight, a fugue in three themes occupying all three voices so that the combination of all three themes would finally occupy every single voice at the combination. 
Fugue 9, now back to four voices, a double fugue whose two themes could be combined at different intervals. 10 was the same principle, also a double fugue whose themes could be combined at different intervals, but now you could bring them in right side up or upside down. See, gradually and gradually more complicated this piece. Fugue 11, that giant monster of chromatic insanity, was a triple fugue using all three subjects from Fugue 8, but now in four voices, and all those themes were invertible. In Fugue 8, they only came in one direction. Now in Fugue 11, they will come in either direction. And we pause here merely to mention that in one of those themes, B-A-C-H was spelled. It was actually B-A-C-C-C-H. Hence, we have a type of signature in this 11th fugue, though clearly not as explicit as the signature we will encounter in the 14th fugue. Fugues 12 and 13 are the mirror fugues. Fugue 12 and four voices, invertible note by note from bottom to top, top to bottom, perfectly playable as two complete different pieces of music and yet the same piece of music. Fugue 13 and three voices now. The same principle, however, rather than turning the fugue on its head, Bach turns it inside out. He inverts all the voices individually and then juggles the order. And now, finally, in Fugue 14, Bach will write the only of its kind, a quadruple fugue in four themes, so that, like we saw in the eighth fugue, all three voices at the moment of combining the themes, every single voice will be taking up a separate theme. Here in Fugue 14, soprano, alto, tenor, and bass will be singing their own themes simultaneously at the combination, at the climax. And we pause here again to mention the four canons in the Art of Fugue, which have their own cumulative complexity, but their position in the Art of Fugue is debatable, and there are a few different solutions to how you might perform them if you were to do a complete performance one of which is to simply leave them out, as one might leave out the 14 canons which appear at the end of the Goldberg Variations. Wait, 14 canons, 14 fugues, what, what's going on with this number here? Well, this number, 14, this is Bach's number. 14, if A equals 1, B equals 2, C equals 3, the numerical alphabet, B plus A plus C plus H equals 14, Bach equals 14. Now, what a fascinating mind that this stuff appealed to a man of such deep religiosity. We know that, anyhow, despite his severe Christian faith, he was also fully occupied in the sciences as well. In fact, the Art of Fugue might possibly be seen as a work for submission to the Misler Society of Musical Sciences to which Bach belonged. So back to that number. For example, Evan, E-V-A-N, is 5 plus 22 plus 1 plus 14 equals 42. So that's my number. Uh, WTF is 23 plus 20 plus 6 equals 49. I should probably do a separate episode on this because there are lots of numbers in Bach, but people get carried away, really carried away, counting bars, counting the numbers of notes in whole books of the well-tempered clavier. For example, people have counted every word in the Bible and paired it up with notes in Bach's B minor mass, or sort of crazy studies like this, but Bach never did that. I'm sorry, the, the music came first. Most of these people who do this type of research, I feel, are often saying, look at how clever I am, rather than look at how clever Bach was. And it does deserve an episode of its own, I said, but at least... Everyone here looking for numeric symbolism can agree on the fact that number 14 was of significance to Bach. But I'm not sure when it became significant to him. If we look at the 14th Prelude and Fugue from the first book of the World Tempered Clavier, composed some 30 years before the Art of Fugue, there we are in F-sharp minor. The Prelude is a very typical one, a quick one. The Fugue is in four voices in 6-4 time, special to me, but I don't see the connection with the number 14. However, 25 years later, in Book 2 of the Well-Tempered Clavier now, for Prelude and Fugue number 14 in Book 2, again, F-sharp minor, F-sharp minor has three sharps, and I think Bach sees this and thinks, ah, Trinity. A religious mind like Bach's is always occupied with that sort of thinking. He composes the most heartbreaking Prelude in three voices... is, yes, a triple fugue in three voices. There's much more symbolism in this fugue than in book one. I have to make an episode on that fugue as well, but let's return to the 14th fugue in The Art of Fugue. Throughout the podcast, I refer to an autograph copy of The Art of Fugue and the original print, and we can see with these two different sources how Bach improved his autograph copy for the original print. In other words, how he made revisions, how he made changes. And the autograph lacks this fugue, lacks the 14th fugue, meaning, very obviously, that it was added later. 
And it's my theory that as Bach saw this whole work taking shape, he realized that he had written 12 fugues. And in the most complex of these fugues, what eventually became Fugue 11, he had written his name into one of those themes. He had signed the work as such. But he saw the whole work taking shape and realized if he added two more fugues, it would be 14 fugues total, his number. And so he actually adds now what is the fourth fugue and this final fugue. And there he spells his name very explicitly. It's no longer B-A-C-C-C-H, but it's B-A-C-H. And he made this fugue his own number, 14, Bach. Now, what am I talking about? Making his name a subject. I mentioned it's a quadruple fugue. Four different melodies will be combined together in counterpoint. And one of those melodies, obviously, must be the Art of Fugue theme that we know very well. Since that theme has appeared in every other fugue and every other canon in some form or another, we must therefore have three others. This piece opens with something that almost sounds like our Art of Fugue theme. Helmut Wacher, the blind organist from Leipzig, playing. Uh, indeed, he definitely has the severe weight that this fugue requires, but just to hear maybe more clarity in the texture, let's listen to Robert Hill do the opening. <laughs> goes on fuguing this very beautiful texture for a while and then breaks off after quite some time into a second fugue midway through and this subject here snakes through the texture and this is our second subject. Here comes the answer. third voice. Now the last voice. Combining the first two subjects to create a double fugue, he now introduces a third subject, which is his name spelled out like this. Because in the German musical alphabet, B natural is H, and B flat is B. There's all kinds of musical alphabets from Do, Re, Mi to A, B, C to Ut, Re, Mi. But in Germany at the time of Bach, H was B natural, B-flat was B. How long had Bach been aware of the fact that his name made this melody? I quote Schweitzer again. In the Weimar days, Bach had remarked to his colleague Walter upon the peculiarity of the four letters of his name, accounting for the musical aptitudes of the Bach family. Walter mentions this at the end of the meager little article that he devotes to his former friend in the Musical Dictionary of 732 and says expressly that the remark came from Herr Kapellmeister Bach himself. This makes it all the more curious that Bach should have waited until the last year of his life before making a fugue on this interesting theme. Friedemann, he's referring to his oldest son, W.F. Bach, when questioned by Forkel upon this point, said positively that his father had never written any fugue but this upon the family name. 
Now, we see this spelling B-A-C-H in a lot of other places. We see it in the St. Matthew Passion. We see it in the final fugue of Book 1 of the Well Tempered Clavier. We see it at the finale of the Variations on von Himmel Hoch for organ. Those are more or less glimpses, very humble signatures. Nothing so overt, nothing so overt as this, and certainly nothing so blatant as to make a fugue upon these four letters. So just imagine that, knowing for the better part of your life that your name makes for this wild chromatic subject, but waiting until the very end of your life to use it as a fugal subject. Well, that is humility and patience of the utmost kind. That is serious. That's what that is. I should also mention why B-A-C-H, why these four notes are a chromatic subject, because actually they are four notes in a row. There are four simultaneous notes on the keyboard. From the A to the B-flat is a half step, from the B-flat to the B-natural is a half step, and from the B-natural to the C, that is a half step. So you really have this cluster of notes which through Bach's masterful manipulation will allow him to manipulate his own name into ways which will launch him into wild harmonic worlds, like the 150, 200 years into the future harmonically. First theme again. The second theme again. The third theme. Fourth theme should be our art of fugue subject, but again, it's missing. The giant mystery, the important one. Is it missing or is it incomplete? As our now friend of the show, Christoph Wolf, said, you don't start writing a quadruple fugue without knowing how the final combination goes. So why then could we have understood this work at a certain point in history to have been incomplete, unfinished, rather than just missing? It has to do with the way that the final fugue was transmitted to us. Because we have these bylager. I spoke of this in the episode about the 13th contrapuntus arranged for two harpsichords. These bylager are these inserts that come along with the autograph copy. They are different from the autograph copy, but they come along with it so that we can see how the original print was assembled. These are like the pieces for making the original print. And in one of these pieces, we find this fugue, the 14th, written in closed score as opposed to open score, in which the rest of the artifugue was written. That is, this fugue came down to us on only two lines, on only two staves, instead of a separate line for each voice. Near the end of the fugue, after Bach combines the first three subjects, he makes a swift modulation out of the cadence, and then the manuscript breaks off. Now it's here where the legend begins, because C.P.E. Bach, his other son, who was not with his father when he was dying, comes down from Potsdam to sort things out with the family. He, for reasons unknown to us, writes at this point in the fugue, at that point on the piece of paper, that little fragment that breaks off, where the name B-A-C-H appears in the countersubject, the composer died. Ah, yes, what an incredible image. We have Bach scribbling with his last strength right before he can add the final fugue subject, right after hurling his name into eternity, B-A-C-H, B-A-C-H, this was me, this was me, he goes, ah, and he drops dead. And no wonder the Romantics adopted this image. No wonder we love this image. It's cinematically perfect. It's, it's like the most incredible, uh, the, the, the most incredible way to die for, for a musician. Of course, from a physiological perspective, we know that he was blind at his death. So that couldn't have happened. And from a musical perspective, one works in a quadruple fugue backward. You start with the four themes combined so as to make sure that the, the piece works. You, you don't just compose three, three subjects and then when you try and add the fourth one, you go, oh, I guess it doesn't work. I wasted all this time composing 80 or 90% of a quadruple fugue. How do we start separating all this BS, this bad scholarship, from the, from the truth, from what really happened? Well, we look closely at the piece of paper that Bach was composing on. 
we see where C.P.E. Bach wrote the words, the composer died. I'll put a link to this image close up in the description, but we see that the staves, the, the very lines of music themselves on the paper are corrupt. To finish such a super complicated, dense fugue of this nature in four voices, a quadruple fugue, highly, highly chromatic on a corrupt piece of paper, it's impossible. And what I mean by corrupt is that the lines were, you know, they were wonky. You know, you have five lines on every staff of music, right? Every good bird does fly, right? That's what you learn. You have five lines, four spaces, F-A-C-E. But on this particular piece of paper, the five lines are broken toward the end of the page. They're not straight. They're missing a line here and there in the middle. And we know from careful studies of every manuscript of Bach's we possess. Bach never wasted paper. He clearly saw this paper in his workshop and thought, I'll have to use what I can of that page to make a draft. So Bach wrote the completion of all four themes on a separate piece of paper, knowing very well that there was no way to complete this quadruple fugue on this corrupt piece of paper. And in the business, we actually call that missing piece of paper. Get ready for the ultimate piece of Bach trivia, ladies and gentlemen. We call that piece of paper Fragment X. And Bach, after writing on Fragment X, the finale of the piece, he started working backwards and decided to use the corrupt piece of paper to join the beginning of this fugue to the end, which was already written on Fragment X. Then since this music, since this fugue, what we have of it, was written in closed score, Bach planned, as he did with the rest of the artifugue, to write it out again in open score, to make a fair copy and eventually to have it engraved upon the plates. What we possess is not an incomplete fugue, but the beginnings of a completed fugue. And it is easy enough for us to test out the four subjects to see if indeed they do fit, to see if indeed this missing theme would have been our beloved artifugue theme. The question is, where do you put it? hear that again that is the combination of all three subjects right before the manuscript breaks off we have in the right speaker our snaking second theme in both speakers sort of holding the bass down the first theme and the b-a-c-h theme in the left speaker let's hear it again So how do we figure out where to put the Artifugue theme, the one that we know by heart by now? Well, the clue comes to us by where the music pauses, because in the music of Bach, and often in classical music in general, there's sort of a motor going. There's always this motor going, and there are two pauses in that combination of the three themes, which might give it away. No rhythm here. No motor here. See, those two areas where I was able to speak and insert words, that's where the motor of the artifugue subject would go. Now, where is the motor of the artifugue subject? Well, let's analyze it. So far, all pretty stagnant music, speeding up, but then da-da-da-da, that's obviously the motor. Those are the only eighth notes in the artifugue theme. We have half note, half note, half note, half note, half note, quarter, quarter, half note, and then eighths. And this is clearly where the motor would go. So if we try and insert that onto the previous combination of all three themes, there are only two places where that motor would go in order to make a smooth combination of all four themes. Okay, let's try it in both places. I will put all three themes in the left speaker as combined by Bach before the manuscript broke off and then put the artifugue theme where it could go in the right speaker just so you could hear how I'm trying to fit it in. Okay, that was kind of interesting. The eighth notes arrived with the second pause of the previous three subjects, but something wasn't right. Let's hear that again. As you could see, something isn't working there. So since that is the eighth notes of the artifugue subject linking up with the second pause in the combination of the previous three subjects, we now need to try it with the eighth notes over the first pause. And to do this, it would require actually starting the artifugue theme before the combination of the previous three subjects. And 
And by God, that's it. That is obviously, that is obviously the intention of the master. That is the combination of the four themes of the quadruple fugue, which was never finished, which was, which was finished rather, but which was lost, which was lost. That is the most magnificent combination. Quadruple fugue. Let's hear that again. And what I love about that is that the first theme from this particular fugue, this 14th fugue, which starts like this, with that very noble theme, is that the highest part of that theme, this A here, coincides exactly with the lowest part of the Art of Fugue theme from the beginning. So when you, what you really have is... There's so much symmetry on so many different levels happening with this proper combination. Now, in piecing together this missing segment of the final fugue, I want to bring our attention to the obituary as prepared by his son, Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach and Johann Friedrich Agricola in 1750, though it wasn't published until 1754, four years after his death. It's not long for a piece of literature, though I suppose it's long for an obituary, but it mentions all the works which were engraved upon copper by Bach during his lifetime. And the last one that they mention is, of course, The Art of Fugue, and it says this, The Art of Fugue. This is the last work of the author, which contains all sorts of counterpoints and canons on a single principal subject. His last illness prevented him from completing his project of bringing the next to last fugue to completion and working out the last one, which was to contain four themes and to have been afterward inverted note for note in all four voices. The work saw the light of day only after the death of the late author. Now, in my interview with Christoph Wolf, I asked him if the combination of all four voices being inverted note for note was meant to be taken literally or was meant to be some sort of 18th century rhetoric, but he responded saying, indeed, it is to be taken literally. So now that we have the combination of all four subjects, let's try and imagine what it could have sounded like inverted. First, let's just try it like a computer inverting it just with a touch of a button. Sounds like absolute madness, but we can do some surgery and see what happens to it. Now that is actually beginning to sound like music. What I did there was lowered all of the B naturals to a B flat, since we are in the key of D minor. You can learn about what a computer inversion is versus what a Bachian inversion is in my episode about the 12th mirror fugue, where Bach actually does invert the entire fugue, sort of almost at the touch of a button, but he adds that human element, which is so important. But Keep in mind that when I've just inverted all four of these voices here, I've sort of got them in whatever order from top to bottom that I wish. Clearly, I cannot conceive of the order that Bach would have conceived. So if I try and space those voices out into a little bit more of, say, uh, an open spacing, we might hear this. Now that... I'm not pretending, of course, to have solved the riddle of the missing fragment, but that, if we are to take the obituary notice literally of all four of those voices being combined, and we found where in the previous combination of the three subjects the artifugue subject falls, and we've inverted it in a sort of aesthetic way and spaced it out so it's not so crunched like that, that could, that could in fact be something close to what was on fragment X, which is very exciting. And I'm going to leave it there for this episode because we're approaching the 30-minute mark and I want to leave you with the Helmut Valcha version of the Unfinished Fugue that we heard at the beginning of the episode. But I just want to plant in your mind this idea of the golden section in this fugue that is 0 0.618, 61.8% of the way through this fugue and how we can use something that Bach typically does in his golden sections to calculate more or less how many bars are missing how many bars were on fragment X. Uh, we can also figure this out just by the average bar per page that was appearing on the engraving. We know from details like that how many copper plates that Bach paid for. 
about how many bars are missing, but I believe that using a device that was typical for Bach to use in his late years during the golden section of a fugue, we can almost calculate exactly. And then from that, using the two combinations of all four subjects we saw, one coming right side up and the other being inverted note by note, we can sort of more or less figure out what exactly is missing. Now, I'm not, of course, prepared to fill in what was missing, nor do I think I ever will be. But how do you feel about it? Here's Helmut Walker. Mm -hmm. 